for that kind introduction. And good morning, everyone. It is lovely to be with you. Uh, it's so encouraging um, to see you all again. It's an honour uh, to open God's Word. Um, I was very moved by that testimony from that young man who had been saved out of Islamic jihadism. And uh, it's amazing that our sins have been atoned for, isn't it? We've just celebrated the cup of the new covenant, and there are three terms in that covenant. Um, and the, the foundational one is the third, where I will remember their wickedness no more. It is magnificent that we can have peace with God because our sins have been atoned for. Now, it's my intention this morning, because I know there are so many young adults and young Christian parents here, um, to give some practical teaching from God's Word to those of you who are building families. But there are unique challenges facing uh, all of us because of the culture in which we live. So we're going to start by thinking about culture and then we'll think about building a Christian home. And I want to um, uh, tackle that uh, by moving through the early verses of the book of Exodus, the first one and a half chapters of Exodus. Exodus records this really powerful story, a uh, moving story, about how God rescues his people from slavery in the land of Egypt. I was once caught off guard. Someone asked me, what is your favorite verse in the Bible? And I instinctively said, Exodus 19, verse 4. God says, for I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. With patience and love, God protects and loves his people and brings them uh, to Mount Sinai. And there he makes a proposal to them. He proposes that they be his. His very own people, the people of God. And so they have to learn to repudiate the values of Egypt and learn to love what God loves and values. And the story ends with the nation living around the tabernacle, uh, that divinely designed place where God chooses to dwell with the people he loved. So in the end, God dwells in the center of his people. It's really interesting that Exodus doesn't end with the people going into the promised land. The journey is to God. Right? And the author of Exodus doesn't seem to care that the book ends with the people still in the desert. God and the people are living in harmony and fellowship together, and that is all that seems to matter. Now, that little summary of the book is important because Exodus has been misused in the past to tell a completely different story. So-called liberation theology offers a false gospel in which poor and oppressed people can gain emancipation and wealth. So Exodus became the book of political revolutionaries, particularly in South America. Now, of course, slavery and poverty are bad things, and freeing people from uh, uh, those bad things is a good thing to do. But Exodus is not a textbook for Christian Marxists. In Exodus, the people, as I say, never reach the Promised Land. Their journey isn't to material prosperity. Their journey is to God himself. I don't quite know what all of you think about Christianity, and what most of you think, but some people and some of my friends think that it's just from, it's escapist. It's escaping from the sadness and the deprivations of this world. Some others think it's about living a nice and harmless life. Christianity isn't about those things. It's about a relationship with God. That's the entire purpose of this ancient book, to explain to us how sinful and helpless people can live in harmony and fellowship with the God of the universe. So let's get underway by reading uh, from the text, from chapter 1 of Exodus, um, verses 8 to 22. Exodus shouldn't be hard to find. I'm talking to myself here. Um, <coughs> uh, we'll start at verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, 
let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became ever more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The context here is that 400 years have passed since the last chapter of Genesis. Uh, Egypt had been saved by an Israelite called Joseph. He had ruled Egypt as a wise and fair administrator. All his family, his father's family, had moved down to Egypt. And over those 400 years, the Israelite families become the 12 tribes of Israel. An extended family becomes a nation. I don't know what you thought of that opening, but it's grim, isn't it? The book of Genesis begins with that beautiful picture of an unspoiled creation. God looked at all that he had made and he said, it is good. It is very good. We see Adam and Eve in the garden enjoying its beauty and fruitfulness. It's a lovely opening. But the book of this, this book opens hellishly, doesn't it? A terrible depiction of life. I'm going to make three points in this talk. And one from this chapter and then two from, as I say, the first ten chapters of chapter two. The headline I want to place over this chapter is the hallmark of a wicked society. We read about Pharaoh's ghastly materialism, that relentless desire to accumulate and store stuff in his treasure cities. We read about slavery and infanticide. What are all those wicked things in have in common? I would suggest that the key hallmark of a wicked society is that it does not value human life. How can a society justify slavery when it believes that slaves are not real persons? In the words of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, slaves, he said, are just living tools. The abolition of slavery is perhaps Christianity's finest achievement in terms of social reform. But it's interesting to think about how William Wilberforce achieved that great victory. It turns out that it was many, many centuries in the making. Some critics ask uh, the, the, that the New Testament doesn't simply, why the New Testament doesn't simply call for the abolition of slavery. Well, think about what would have happened if Paul had done that. You'd have had another Spartacus type revolution which would have been crushed by the Romans. Paul's strategy, says the historian Tom Holland, was to set off a depth charge in the ancient world. And, and how did he do that? He said that in Christ there is neither slave nor free. Paul was saying that personhood didn't depend on social status. And so in the early church, a Christian master could give orders to his Christian slave. But in church, the slave might be one of the master's elders. And gradually the idea, and it's a Christian idea, that all people have equal moral worth, that idea took root in culture. So in the U.S. De Declaration of Independence, we read these famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But that truth isn't self-evident at all. It's a Christian idea. If you had said it to an ancient Roman or Greek, they would have laughed in your face. It was the Christian concept of the Imago Dei, that all of us are made in God's image, that eventually led to the abolition of slavery. So once a society loses the Christian concept of personhood, slavery becomes a live option. Well, you might say slavery is one thing, but how can a society justify the killing of innocent babies when it believes that babies are not real persons? They're just potential persons. Egypt wasn't alone in holding that view. Fifty years before Christ was born, the Romans had heated swimming pools. But don't let that sophistication fool you. I want to read you a fragment of a letter written by a Roman nobleman to his pregnant wife. He says, I remain in Alexandria. I ask and beg you to take care of our baby son. And as soon as I receive payment, I shall send it up to you. If you are delivered of a child before I come home, if it is a boy, keep it. If a girl, discard it. <laughs> 
it was entirely lawful and normal to leave a girl or a boy with a disability out in the woods to be eaten by animals. And it happened so often that Rome had a much higher percentage of men than women. Even in large families, there was rarely more than one daughter. We tend to measure different cultures by the sophistication of their artistic life or their wealth and power. Use those standards, and ancient Egypt and Rome would be admired. Busloads of tourists would ooh and ah as they saw the Colosseum, the cultural artifacts in Pharaoh's store cities. And we can fall into the same trap today. We can be tempted to think of Western civilization as a truly magnificent and progressive thing. Just look at those skyscrapers in New York or all that history in Prague. But now apply the litmus test that I mentioned earlier. The hallmark of a truly wicked society is that it does not value human life. If you read on in Exodus, you come across the infamous plagues. And the first plague saw the Nile being turned into blood. And it's obvious from the passage we have just read why God chose that first plague. Pharaoh had already made the Nile red with blood when he ordered Hebrew babies to be thrown into it. I do sometimes wonder if we could see Western society as heaven sees it. We would see the Hudson and the Thames run red with blood. Violence against the most vulnerable is the hallmark of a wicked society. And once again we see the question of personhood being raised. What makes a human being a person? Once we start to believe that personhood depends on function, then our society is descending into terrible violence. So if I am self-sufficient, if I can decide things and communicate well, then I am a person. But if I am dependent, if I can't decide things or communicate, then I'm not a person. That functional definition of personhood is the reason why euthanasia vans now drive around Holland. You can order one up, I'm not making this up. An old person who has started to show signs of dementia can have their life ended by a mobile killing station that will arrive at their house. The same argument, of course, applies to pre-born children and to infants. It's interesting to read how the early church lived in a culture in which abortion and infanticide were normalized. They didn't just protest. They set up orphanages. They rescued thousands of innocents, especially girls. Scripture honors two women for the stand they took against the killing of infants. We read about them. We even have their names recorded, Shifra and Pua. They were medics and the midwives who dared to disobey Pharaoh because they knew the value that God places on a human life. Some Christians have shaken their heads at this story and said, the two midwives lied. It's always wrong to lie. Well, if that sort of absolutism is right, why does Scripture commend them? Why does the text explicitly tell us that God blessed them? Here's the difference. We believe in objective morality, not absolute morality. So the Bible does say that it is wrong to lie. We can't tell lies just because we prefer to lie, because morality isn't a matter of personal preference. But biblical morality is a bit like a seamless robe. So we can't divorce a specific moral question from its context. Take a member of the French resistance who is captured and tortured by the German Gestapo. With enormous bravery, he tells lies about the whereabouts of other members of the resistance. His actions are moral because saving the lives of innocent people is more important than lying to a murderous dictator. Now, before we leave this horrible story and turn to the lovely story found in the start of chapter 2, I want to pause and reflect on the motivation of Pharaoh. It's easy to write him off as a sadistic sociopath, but the text tells us in verse 6, sorry, verse 10, why Pharaoh was prepared to murder infants. And we can sum it up in one word. Paranoia. He was afraid. He was terrified that the Israelites would begin a political revolution. Or they might side with an invader. That's why he only murdered the male babies. He saw any man as a threat to his own power. It's often the case, isn't it, that people who idolise power exhibit paranoia. The most obvious example comes at the start of the New Testament. A man that history calls Herod the Great suffered from paranoia. Earlier on in his life, the Roman Emperor Augustus had given Herod the title the King of the Jews. 
And so when he heard that a baby had been born who would one day become the king of the Jews, Herod's paranoia exploded. He had already murdered three of his own children out of fear that they might one day depose him. So he thought nothing of sending his troops to Bethlehem to murder every male child under two years. Paranoia can cause us to treat others with anger and even cruelty. And it nearly always rises up in people who idolise power. Paranoia is a terrible thing. It destroys our ability to trust others. So the most innocent of actions are interpreted as a nasty dig or a deliberate slight. I know I've had to repent of paranoia more than once in my life. So I suggest, I suggest for your own spiritual well-being that you might want to examine your own heart for that ugly sin and repent of it. Anyway, with a sense of relief, let's now turn to the lovely story found in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I mentioned the contrast between the beginning of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. Of course, in the Genesis story, the skies darken after sin enters into God's good creation. And soon the earth is filled with violence. And things become so bleak that God determines to bring a terrible judgment on the earth, the great flood. And I want you to keep that in mind as we read 1 to 8. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And well, well, we'll keep reading. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the waters. I mentioned the start of Genesis. The skies darken, and eventually God has to bring judgment in the form of the great flood. Humanity would have been obliterated had it not been for that one righteous man, Noah, and his family. Noah, in obedience to God's command, builds an ark, and he and his family shelter from the flood waters in the ark. Now, I mention that because it seems clear that the writer of Exodus had the story of Noah at the back of his mind when he wrote Exodus chapter 2. It tells how Moses' parents built a little ark. And like the Genesis ark, they coated it with pitch before setting that fragile little craft upon the waters of the Nile. Now, what is the purpose of the illusion? Um, I think it goes something like this. Think back to Noah and his family for a moment inside the ark. They huddled uh, in, in that wooden structure. They represented the entire future of humanity. If they had perished, humanity's story would have ended. So all the hopes and aspirations of the human race were bound up with that little ark. And the writer of Exodus is pointing us to the little baby floating on the river Nile, telling us once again that the future of the world lay inside that little ark. As we move through the book, we shall see Moses presented time and time again as the captain of Israel's salvation. He leads his people from danger to safety. And by accepting his lordship, the people were rescued from the power of Pharaoh. So all of Israel's hopes and aspirations were bound up within that little ark on the Nile. And all our hopes too. Because it was from that nation of Israel that a greater than Moses would come. And like Moses, we first meet him as a fragile baby. He lies crying in a wooden manger, a wooden feeding trough. But when grown up, Christ would come, become the saviour of the world. My first point was the hallmark of a wicked society. My second point is the vulnerability of the Saviour. It seems to make no sense to place Moses in the very spot where male Hebrew babies were being killed. But then it seems to make no sense to keep the baby Jesus in the place where Herod's soldiers would slaughter the innocents. 
The baby Moses cried because he was cold and alone. He wanted to feel the warmth and security of his mother's arms. Well, think of the first traumatic memories of the baby called Jesus. That panicked, rushed packing of what few possessions that little family owned. The terrifying journey by night out of Bethlehem. The infant Christ, I say this reverently, had to experience childhood trauma. He could sense his mother's fear, could see his earthly father's face draw tight with anxiety. I am very glad that the Lord Jesus did not arrive on this earth as a full-grown man. Because to be fully human is to grow from infancy. And in a fallen world, some of us have childhood trauma that lurks in the back of our minds. Jesus was made just like us, yet without sin. So perhaps he can even remember crying inconsolably or being too afraid to cry. This ancient story is setting a pattern, a pattern that will be fulfilled at the first Christmas. God did not arrive to rescue his people at the head of a column of tanks. This was no mere power struggle. That was a hard lesson for Moses to learn because Moses wanted to use power. But in the end, he learns that he will save his people by declaring God's name to them. In other words, he would tell people what God was really like. And that knowledge would inspire their love and loyalty and draw out their trust so that eventually they would follow Moses out of Egypt. So with us, God will not save you by zapping your enemies with a death ray. In Christ, God makes himself vulnerable. He comes close and reveals what he is really like. And as you discover what God is really like, that draws out your love and your loyalty to him. It's inspired and so faith will grow. And so you will trust him, trust him enough to leave the value system of this world and live in fellowship with him. So we have thought about the hallmark of a wicked society. Societies, no matter how wealthy or sophisticated they seem, are wicked if they do not value human life. Then we thought about the vulnerability of the savior. God makes himself vulnerable in order to win our hearts. But lastly, I want to think about the strategic role of Christian parents. And to make this point, uh, turn with me to Hebrews 11. Just a few verses from Hebrews 11. We'll read 23 to 26. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. Exodus 2 is a lovely little drama, isn't it? Um, You think of Miriam, Moses' sister. Uh, hiding behind a tree as she watches Pharaoh's daughter uh, open the little ark and lift the crying infant out. Um, I mean, we have to uh, commend Pharaoh's daughter for her kindness. In the midst of this pitiless scene, she shows some genuine humanity. And Miriam waits for just the right moment uh, to approach the Egyptian princess and offers to find a nurse for the child. And so in a moment that must make the reader smile, Moses' own mum gets paid by the palace to raise her own child. Moses' parents were called Ammon and Jochebed. Perhaps one day, you know, brothers and sisters, you will see a great throng in heaven around Moses. And rightly so, because he is perhaps the greatest leader in all of world history. But in the background, you might see an ordinary looking couple, smiling with quiet satisfaction as they look at their son. Right from his birth, Ammon and Jochebed had discerned that Moses was no ordinary child. God had his hand upon him. And so they made the heart-rending decision after three months to set him afloat on the Nile, to entrust him into God's care. How hard it must be for a parent to come to that point where they must set their child afloat and entrust them to God. But now Moses' mum has a few precious years to nurture and develop her son. And the question is, how should she go about her task? What should her priorities be? Well, Hebrews tells us, Moses faced some crucial choices in his life. 
Think about him as a teenager. Instead of being raised in a tiny little hut with no amenities, he suddenly finds himself walking on the marble floors of the palace. He has but to clap his hands and a slave will feed him grapes. I just made that up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> he starts to learn the sophisticated culture of the Egyptians. He learns new languages. He learns how to write. He starts to appreciate business and art and political statesmanship. Before long, he must have looked and sounded like an Egyptian aristocrat, someone who was comfortable with diplomatic protocols. Now, of course, God had ordained this journey because Moses needed all those skills when he interacted with Pharaoh through the plagues. But what a risk God took. How easy it would have been for Moses to sneer at his humble upbringing, to dissociate himself from those slaves and start walking like an Egyptian. And if you're a certain age, you might get that joke. <laughs> Hebrews tells us that he made a much better choice. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. And that decision, brothers and sisters, was all down to his mother and father. In the few years they had to take care of Moses, they built truth into Moses' heart. Of course, they told Moses the old Bible stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but they also showed him the lasting value of God's values in contrast to the values of Egypt. And by refusing to become bitter or envious, they showed their son how to live in hope. They answered all his questions so that when he left the family home, he could survive in a pagan world that offered glittering attractions like status and money and power. I don't even really need to apply the point to it. Being a Christian parent is perhaps the most strategic job anyone can have in this cultural moment. You will only have your children for a few short years. Soon they will be walking down the marble floors of a pagan world. And it will be the truth that you have built into them, the truth that you have modelled in your own life, that will protect them from worldliness. Now, I'm not trying to instill guilt here. The father in the story of the prodigal son did everything right, and yet he had to experience the heartache of a prodigal. So none of us should judge the other in how families turn out. That's not my point. My point is better understood as an opportunity. Think once again of Ammon and Jochebed in heaven, looking at their son. How grateful to God they must feel that God used their routine, humdrum lives to build up a servant like Moses. How privileged they must feel. Now, none of you will raise a Moses. But you might raise someone who will be used greatly by God. Or they might be a parent or a grandparent to a great servant in years to come. So be encouraged when you catch a glimpse of the potential of your children. And that point brings us full circle, doesn't it? The value of a human life. One of the reasons why abortion on demand and infanticide are to be shunned is that it's not just one life that has ended. Think of the potential of future generations sacrificed on the altar of convenience. The value of a human life. So we've thought about the hallmark of a wicked society, the vulnerability of the saviour and the strategic role of Christian parents. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this fellowship of God's people. Pray you would watch over them and protect them and unify them and build them closer together, that they walk together in love and harmony. But we pray particularly, Father, for those to whom you have given the responsibility to raise children, to raise children in a culture which is increasingly hostile and increasingly pagan. And so we thank you for the example of Ammon and Jochebed and pray that you would give enormous wisdom and spiritual energy uh, to Christian parents in this room, that they may raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and so build truth into their lives, so model truth in front of them, that when they do go out into the pagan world, they will stand for Christ. So we commit them lovingly to you, in Jesus' name. Amen.